Coming up on DTNS, dating apps want your health info, but can you trust them? Plus, foldables start to get better and a webcam you stick in the middle of your screen. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, December 15th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. There is a longer version of this show full of almond butter and ethical dilemmas called Good Day Internet. You can get that at patreon.com slash DTNS. By the way, big thanks to our top patrons, including Bjorn Andre, Jeff Wilkes, and Paul Reese. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google announced that its lightweight Android Go OS reached over 200 million daily active users. The company also announced that the Go edition of Android 12 will roll out to some devices in 2022, opening apps up to 30% faster and providing smoother animations. The Financial Times sources say the U.S. Treasury will add eight Chinese companies, including DJI, to the Chinese military industrial complex companies list. This is different from the entity list. This list blocks U.S. citizens from investing in the companies. U.S. Commerce Department already named DGI to the entity list. That's the one that bars U.S. firms from exporting to a company without a license. Disney Plus added support for Apple's SharePlay feature that lets people co-view videos over FaceTime. SharePlay already worked with Apple services as well as NBA, TikTok, Twitch, Paramount Plus, and Showtime. A SharePlay session can share a Disney Plus video with up to 32 people. You have to start the FaceTime call first, then open up the Disney Plus app, which will then have a notice about SharePlay. Then you tap that you want to start a video and everybody else can see it and control its playback. You can even choose to keep the FaceTime call on one device, like an iPhone, and the video playing on another, like an iPad or an Apple TV, if you're in that universe. All participants will need a Disney Plus subscription for this to work and the latest version of their Apple devices OS. Hey, Android fans, you want a tablet? We got a new tablet. Samsung announced a new tablet, the Tab A8, coming to the U.S. in January. It has a 10.5-inch screen, 1920 by 1200 resolution. You can choose three or four gigabytes of RAM, between 32 to 128 gigabytes of storage. Also has a micro SD card slot, so you can put an SD card in there and get it up to a terabyte. A 7,040 milliamp hour battery and supports 15-watt fast charging. Available in gray, silver, and pink gold. Uh, no price on it yet, but it's expected to be around the $230 of the previous model, or maybe even less. A little bit more Apple news. The company removed mentions of its announced program to scan iCloud photos for child sexual abuse materials, or CSAM, from its child safety webpage. Apple announced it would indefinitely delay the feature back in September following concerns from privacy and security researchers. Given that they launched the modified text message notification and they removed this, I feel like this one's done, that we're not going to be seeing that. All right, let's talk of more concepts. Do you know Dell's doing that Dell thing, showing off some concepts in advance of CES? Three prototype products on display this week designed for a seamless work experience. There's the Concept Flow, the Concept Stanza, and the Concept Pari. Not P-A-R-I-S, but P-A-R-I. Flow is a Wi-Fi 6 dock that you can hook up to a monitor, keyboard, mouse, and charger, and then you don't need to click your laptop into a physical thing. You just set it down near the dock and it collects over Wi-Fi. Bluetooth is used to determine if the laptop is near or not. Second is the Concept Stanza. That's an 11-inch companion device tablet specializing in converting handwriting to text. If you're really into that, I guess it's really cool, but it doesn't do much else. And finally, Concept Pari is a magnetic webcam that can stream 1080p footage over Wi-Fi, which means no more nose cam. You can put this wherever you want it. It can go anywhere a magnet can go. So it's wireless. It's like a little cylinder. And if you get a monitor with magnets behind the display, presumably Dell would make those too, then you could put that little tiny cylindrical camera right in the middle of your screen right at what you're looking at when you talk to somebody on Zoom or if you're reading something. That way you can look right at the camera while also looking at your screen instead of looking right below your camera. Yes, the company that put a webcam underneath a laptop screen spawning endless instances of nose cam has mended its ways and mm -hmm. has a solution for you. Uh, of course, 
You could also uh, keep it in the charging dock, uh, which you could mount in the normal place on top of your monitor. Uh, but you could also hold it in your hand, so it has some other flexible options like showing off stuff, like sketches or prototypes on your desk during a meeting. Uh, you could even put it in its dock backwards because it's wireless uh, and make sure it doesn't turn on accidentally. Anyway, these are all just concepts. None of them are necessarily going to become shipping products, but I'm kind of into concept Perry. I think that's that's clever. It is, I, but I don't trust. I don't trust a camera without a battery, Sarah. I don't. I don't. It's got a battery. You, or excuse you me, with, excuse That's me, the with whole the battery point. is what I meant to say. I don't trust one no. with one because here's what happens. Imagine those times when you're, uh, I don't know, you're professionally gaming, and your mouse, which happens to have batteries, they die in the middle of the most important match of your career. I don't want that happening to my camera. Like in the middle of DTNS, imagine if my camera died. What would we do? Oh no. We'd all freak out and everyone would be mad at Scott for his camera going dead. So that's the only caveat. Otherwise, that's a really cool idea. I just don't yeah. know if I trust batteries. It's a cool idea. I, I I wasn't aware that nose cam was such a thing. Um, I understand what it means. Uh, and it's something that I think a lot of us deal with. You know, my, my, uh, my webcam is above my screen. And so you probably get a little nose cam going on there. Uh, putting a camera in the middle of your screen while your eye level would be nice because of that, it doesn't seem like it makes a lot of logical sense for the person with the webcam. Mm. What if you? What if that webcam's right over a really important word? Well, you gotta... well that's I kind mean, of the idea. This this thing is like smaller than a finger, right? You just you just pop it in the middle. You can work around it. You can move your window I, around. I suppose you could. Yeah, and maybe maybe it's a non-issue. That was just that was my first feeling about it. Is like I put something in the middle of the screen, and you know, my screen is <laughs> set up very specifically for a reason. I can't have anything in the way of that. Yeah, yeah. I think the device looks cool, though. I'll give them that. That it little does. cylinder is rad. Yeah, I like it. I do wonder if this all solves all nose cams, though. Because a lot of nose cam, <laughs> some of the nose cam comes from having it too low, like in that Dell laptop. But sometimes it comes just because your laptop's on a lower surface than you, well, even and, if it's at the and, top of your laptop. So you could, if you put that thing even lower, you might be risking nosier cam. Mm, even worse. <laughs> well, and to be clear, and I, I'm new to this concept, but nose cam can be the camera's too high, so you're looking up, right? And you kind of look funny or the camera's too low and it's actually looking up your nose. Yeah, that's the the more common is is your you it's below you and it's shooting right up your nose. Yeah. yeah. I do think yeah. it's not it's lost on me that this is small enough to put inside your nose. Oh, you hey. Really want to do. Now now we're, now we're talking. Now we're talking. Forget about <laughs> Google Glass or or it's, a it's spectacles. It's all to put inside your nose, but where is it going to go? You're looking the other way at this point. <laughs> that's a way to that's a privacy feature. If you want to make sure no one can see your video, stick it in your. No. Yeah. It's, it's just in. Sorry, TV guys. For a nose new cam. This is yeah. pretty <laughs> Super nose information. Cam. Uh, well, we talked about uh, Oppo's uh, Find N phone the other day, and we have a few more details. The company announced the Verge's Sam Byford has been using it for a week and called it impressive and refined. That's pretty good, right? The Find N is a 7.1 inch, 120 hertz OLED display when unfolded with a nine uh, by eight by four aspect ratio. So it's slightly rectangular. Also uses a foldable panel made by Samsung with some Oppo patented technology included like the hinge. The screen wraps around a teardrop, teardrop shaped hinge, which makes the crease wider, but also less visible. Might be good, might be bad, depending on who you are. The hinge lets the phone shut without a gap, probably something that a lot of people would like. The screen is protected by ultra thin glass and rated for 220,000 folds, which is the same as the Galaxy Z Fold. That's a lot. Yeah, you know, is it for the life of your uh, device? Depends on who you are. When folded, the Find N has a 5.49 inch 60 hertz screen on the outside with a two uh, by one aspect ratio, making it look a little bit like a regular Android phone, a little thicker with a slightly larger bezel on the left side, maybe more than you would normally expect, but this is a flagship phone, otherwise pretty normal specs. Snapdragon 888 up to 12 gigs of RAM, 50 megapixel uh, camera, etc. The fingerprint sensor is in the power button and it supports reverse charging with the Qi standard. So if you're in China, you can get one starting December 23rd, starting at 7,699 won, about 1,200 US dollars. 
For comparison, if you'd like to do that sort of thing, the iPhone starts at thirteen hundred one more. Yeah, so the iPhone is more expensive than this because uh, when you do those conversions, it's like, well, that's twelve hundred dollars, which sounds expensive, but that's cheaper than the fourteen hundred dollar equivalent of the Fold from the Galaxy Fold. It's also cheaper than an iPhone because prices are sometimes different, right? You 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 can't just yeah. do this straight comparison. So so that's a that's a good comparison to make there. Um, I, this thing is expensive, but it's not as expensive as a lot of the foldables have been. I think that's the takeaway there. Uh, I think this shows that there's something to the foldable market. The fact that Oppo went to the trouble of saying, well, let's get the display from Samsung, uh, which makes the display. If you're like, why is Samsung selling a display to a competitor, Oppo? It's because it's a big company and part of its business is displays and selling displays to everybody, kind of the way Samsung sells chips to everybody, even though it also makes phones. Two different parts of the company. Anyway, uh, this is Oppo saying, let's take that display and let's figure out how to improve on it. Let's make that crease a little less visible. And uh, Sam Byford said that it kind of disappeared, which it never really does with the Galaxy Fold. Uh, that the fact that it lays flat, like you said, Sarah, when it's folded up, that's a big deal. Whereas the, the Galaxy Fold never quite lays entirely flat. And that screen, even with that little bit of bezel that you're talking about, sure looks like a phone. It's a lot thicker, but it looks like a phone. Whereas, again, the Galaxy Fold doesn't really look like kind of a tall, weird phone when it's folded up. So this is all incremental progress in making foldables work a little better. And I think that is telling the fact that we're seeing that kind of progress means maybe there is a market here. But yeah. boy, is it incremental. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we've been talking about this for a couple of years now. Feels and like it. We're I, just I remember still getting to that point. I remember hearing about the first one and going, uh, the first foldable I'd seen and went, I don't know about this. This seems ridiculous to me and kind of, you know, uh, prototypey and not going to be a thing that we'll see do very well. And I think I was wrong. I think this might be the future. Um, if they can figure it out. And the thing that is most impressive is I'm looking at that thing laid flat. I don't see a seam. That just looks like a tiny tablet to me. Um, and I think that's the idea. So the closer we get to that or the better we get uh, in that range, the the better off we're going to be. You know, when when will it become a mainstream draw where people are like, I got to have a foldable? I, I don't know when that is, but I'm starting to think they're probably here to stay. Yeah. And, and that's that's where I think I'm going with this is, Sarah, you're, you're entirely right. Like this isn't like, oh, here's the one. We fixed it all, right? But the fact that they made even that incremental improvement means it was mm -hmm. worth doing. They didn't look at it like, well, this is all we could do, and the market's not that big, so let's not bother. They were like, yeah, even though these are small improvements, the market's big enough that those are notable. Those are those are things that we'll be able to get people to to hop on board for. So, oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when the when the day comes where it's like I've got a phone or you know a, a small a, a mobile device. And I also have a tablet, and it's all the same thing. I'm in. Mm -hmm. I think we're we're still figuring that out. Yeah, it's this is still for early adopters. It's but it's getting better every time. So that time when you might be like, hey, I think that's that's the one. I mean, obviously everybody's waiting for Apple to come out with theirs. That that often is the harbinger of a product category being accepted. But but yeah, everybody's waiting waiting for that one. Yeah. We get some of our best ideas on what to talk about on the show from you. Uh, man, we do a lot of work. We look at Feedly's. We look at Google News. We look at Tech Meme. We look at subreddit. In fact, your subreddit is one of the best ways to let us know, hey, this is important to us. So get on in there and vote at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. All right. You want to go to Norway? Let's take a trip. Let's talk about data protection. Uh, Norway's Data Protection Authority has fined dating app Grinder. 65 million Norwegian Chrome, which is about uh, equivalent in U.S. dollars, 7.1 million. The authority determined Grindr's violated or Grinder violated the GDPR by sharing some data, including sexual orientation with advertisers without proper consent procedures. Uh, basically, until it had uh, until it changed the practice in April of 2020, Grinder required you to, to agree to sharing uh, this information in order to use the app at all. Uh, that is a big GDPR no-no. This kind of thing is notable given the increase of uh, the amount of data individuals are sharing on dating apps themselves. Uh, much more people are manually adding things like vaccination status to their profiles. And apps like Hinge and Bumble are considering features to let users um, add other kinds of sexual health information. 
It's a little bit different, though, than just taking that information in general. Uh, the conversation, or excuse me, the conversation, meaning the entity of the conversation, notes that profiles in apps like Grinder and Adam for Adam uh, can include HIV status, uh, for example. Seems like a, 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 a good thing to do. However, some dating apps like Tinder's sparse structure don't lend themselves to sharing such info and may need to adapt. What this comes down to is y'all you, you, goofed. You have too much information that you're sharing and you didn't go through the right channels to do it. So knock it off or you're going to pay through the nose <laughs> with all your crone. Well, sure. Uh, uh, gr Grinder uh, stopped doing it in April 2020, so that's good. Uh, but there's there's a whole question here about data sharing beyond that. Like, that's the news hook of like, hey, they 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 got busted for this. They say they've mended their ways. They even try to argue that this shouldn't have been, and they might appeal it. Uh, but there's more sensitive data coming, not just sexual orientation, but also things like. Uh, sexually transmitted diseases where people are wanting to share that. They want a good way to handle that kind of sensitive information so that people are informed when they're, when they're making dating decisions. Now you may sit there and say like, who's going to admit that? And yeah, a lot of people won't. And that's a whole problem of itself. But there are situations where, where, like you said, with HIV, for example, people are, are willing to say like, yes, I've got, I've been tested. This is my status. And it won't necessarily prevent them from getting a date. It's just good practice. You're more likely to, you know, make a bond or whatever. So vaccination status, COVID, what I'm, uh, what I'm comfortable doing, uh, in a world with COVID, that's a huge part of this as well. And so with all of that together, like these apps need to accommodate that, not only make it easy for people to share, but make it easy for people to share privately, uh, people to be in control of that. No, it's not going to be shared with anyone else, but the people they want to share it with when they want to share it. Uh, and some apps, it's like, like you said, like Grindr, Adam for Adam and others like that are, are doing okay with this. They're sort of leading the way, but there's a lot of apps out there that are dragging their feet. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's the big thing. If you're on a dating app, if you're interested in meeting somebody, and I'm not even talking about any app in particular, but an app where people are, you know, potentially going to meet a romantic match. There are all sorts of things that you would p potentially want that other person to know um, about you or want to know about them. And that feels kind of safe, right? Well, but then when you get into a situation where it's like, well, this app is sharing this information with advertise advertisers that, you know, you're not in control of, you don't even really know what it is, uh, you're you're going to be uh, served ads to you or to somebody that you've talked to on an app, you know, in the future, that's where it just, it gets bad. And it sounds like um, the GDPR issues that Grindr went through uh, in 2020, you know, they're trying to rectify, but but this, th this is something, you know, I, I think about this all the time, you know, even when I'm sharing information with my, the company that pays my healthcare, <laughs> you know, it's like, this is all stuff that is, we, we should have as much information about as possible. Yeah. I'm, I, I don't think we're trying to imply that, uh, that if you share your vaccination status or your HIV status or some other sexual tra transmitted disease on a dating app, that it's going to go to advertisers. Uh, in fact, I think that Grinder story shows that it's not. They're going to be careful about that. The next step is, but are you going to handle it responsibly? Are you mm. going to make sure it doesn't get shared with other members accidentally? Are you going to be HIPAA compliant or wherever the equivalent is in, in the country I live in? Uh, are you going to make sure that it's secure, that it doesn't get leaked out in a data breach? I mean, that's where I'm going with this. I'm, I'm not worried that Grinder's going to share it with an advertiser. Forget that anymore. It's like, yeah, that that ship has, sh ship has sailed. They've been punished for that. But there's even more sensitive data coming down the pike that they need to be even more responsible with than just not sharing with third-party data or third-party advertisers. Back in July, we told you about the 11-inch glass lantern Bluetooth speaker from Sony called the LSPX S3. It was the third version of the speaker, uh, and one of the less, least expensive, although still fairly pricey, at $350. It's taken a minute, but The Verge finally has a full-on review of this very weird but beautiful speaker. On the downside, the candlelight-looking speaker has no player pause controls on the device itself, only volume, a call-answering button, and power. 
Seems like an odd choice to put the call answering and not the play pause, but okay. It is also a little fragile. It's made of glass. Uh, it's got a very weighty bottom, so it's not easy to tip over. But this is, you know, for a Bluetooth speaker that you can move around, something you want to move around carefully, has no voice control options, so it's not that kind of speaker, and comes in any color you want as long as it's silver. So just just, <laughs> just the one color. Uh, the battery lasts eight hours on a charge, but again, it's kind of heavy and kind of fragile, so I'm not sure how much moving around you're going to do, but maybe taking it outside you know, for a barbecue or something like that. The light has three modes. Uh, one is pretty steady, and you can adjust the brightness on that. One that flickers, and you can adjust the rate of the flickering. They say it's pretty subtle, though. And then there's one that pulses in time with the music, which is also apparently very subtle. The candlelight effect is apparently pretty convincing. The sound quality is clear, and it even supports the high bitrate LDAC codec on Android, which Apple and Tidal and a bunch of others support as well. But no voice control options. No voice, yeah. Oh, is that yeah. it? That's the killer for you? Really? Well, oh, okay. for sure. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, you're you mentioning, like, it's fragile, made of glass, kind of beautiful, don't want to move it around too much. Fine. But no voice control? I yeah, mean, what am see, I getting seems weird. here? Seems weird in 2021. Also, they missed an opportunity. They should have only sold this. It should have only been available on April 20th at 4.20 p.m. for $420. <laughs> You may be so right. that, I'm yeah, telling you, does, missed it does look Sony. like the kind of thing that would be used at such a time. I, I see what you're saying. <laughs> mm. This is, but think, do you, do neither of you have a Bluetooth speaker that's not voice enabled that you just used as a, as like a portable speaker for your phone? I, I do have one over here um, that's currently sitting here, but I, but I'll when it's when it's warm outside, I take it out in the backyard. Yeah, yeah. So I do that's have what that, this and it's is not voice being. active. Yeah, that it's that's why it doesn't have voice because it's like, well, it's not for that. Yeah, it's not a fixture in your house. I could see that. I, mean, I just think I just think Sarah. It's is, a fragile candle. Yeah, exactly. Also, so it is kind like of a, living in both worlds. It's like a person. It? It's like a permanent piece of furniture in a way. And in 2021, if that thing is a speaker and it doesn't have voice control, it feels like an odd man out, given its stationary status. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of Victorian. Otherwise, you're just not going to move it around. Yeah. it's like you're no, just you be use like, this. Ah, don't don't touch to the light your candle. way to bed at night. <laughs> You'll carry it with you with the yeah. soothing uh, I mean, lullaby. Not if it's fragile. I won't. <laughs> well, you know, like in Victorian times, you had to carry a candle, it's, you know, fragile just, or not. My entire, and you know, I'm probably on like one side of the spectrum of this. Like my whole household and studio where I am now is all voice uh, based. Mm -hmm. everything is, you know, I tell to do something at this point or that point, or, you know, there's certain routines that I've set up ahead of time. I'm very voice oriented. Uh, so to have this sounds great. Sounds like a smart bulb. Smart bulbs do candlelight stuff too, but I can talk to them. Yep. There you have it. You All right. Well, let, let's um it, let, let's move to the sea, shall we? Mm. Uh, if what? you're not familiar with a small jellyfish found in the Mediterranean Sea, specifically called the Clydia hemispherica, well, let's tell you about it. Brady Wasbord, a postdoctoral scholar at bio, biology and uh, biological engineering at Caltech, lead author on a recent paper in Cell, highlighting this very jellyfish that's been genetically modified so that its neurons grow glow, rather, when they fire, which could offer new insight into the workings of brain activity in non-human species. The researchers introduced a snippet of DNA called GCAMP, which creates a green fluorescent protein. It's been used in mice, zebrafish, flies in the past. So to insert the glowing genes, the researchers took account of Claudia's reproductive system, which is triggered by light. This is where it gets cool. Weisberg says, two hours after the lights go on, the jellyfish release eggs and sperm into the water. They're like, okay, we're ready to go. Then the researchers collected the eggs, in this case, injected them with the snippet of code for the green fluorescent trait that they wanted to insert, along with a protein that helped to splice it into the jellyfish's DNA. Now they have a creature to observe under our microscope as it eats, while its neurons glow. Weisberg says, you can do really high resolution experiments looking at every neuron's activity over time while the animal is behaving. Essentially, and, they are understanding the brain activity of the jellyfish. And the weird thing about this particular jellyfish, not all jellyfish are like this, but this one has a modular brain, not a centralized brain. So like they want to figure computer. out, like, how does that work? How does it know 
Because it does the same behavior of like grab food with tentacle, move food towards mouth. But this weird fish can keep eating just as a mouth. In other words, if it get, if the mouth gets chopped off of the jellyfish, the mouth can keep eating <laughs> and live because it has enough brain in it. <laughs> and they're like, we need to see how this works. And this is the way to do it. Like have the thing light up as it's doing stuff so we could see how it's communicating. Uh, also, anybody reading, reading The Expanse, uh, I will say no more, but there's a there's a connection here to a proto molecule you may or may not know. <laughs> mm, I thought about that as well. Yep. I also, sure. I just, I don't like to make giant leaps, but I'll make one in this case. I, I could see a future where we, I mean, we already do this with some dyes when we're getting CT scans and other things where we can kind of see where stuff is and where it's moving to. And, you know, we're getting pretty good at scanning the brain and stuff. There could come a day where we could put a little light in our brain and we could follow it around and have a better oh, idea man. of how things are functioning. Why not? Yeah, I mean, I've been injected with dye quite recently to figure out <laughs> yes, what true. my brain activity is doing, but it's not the same as this. No, this is, not quite. This is yeah. real cool. Like, oh, Sarah's thinking fluorescent lights, <laughs> fluorescent lights. <laughs> and we want voice control. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Good please. Point. You know, I'm not going to touch anything. It's COVID. Uh, well, if you have an urge to travel, <laughs> speaking of COVID, but you're not able to go very far, don't worry. Chris Christensen has a few sites you might want to check out. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. As the COVID numbers rise again, I know some people are getting a little concerned about traveling again, but you may have some opportunities for traveling locally as a tourist in your own city. I did, had a chance to do this in San Francisco just last weekend and went on a bay cruise, which I haven't done in many years. You can find a number of those opportunities at various tour companies like Viator.com, GetYourGuide.com, or Airbnb Experiences, and check out your local city as you would see it as a tourist. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Uh, it's, a cool, it's cool to have those resources. I did that once when I lived in San Francisco. I, I went to Fisherman's Wharf and, and stayed with some friends at a hotel, and we pretended to be tourists. It was really fun. That does sound fun. Yeah. yeah. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, Rick in Kenwood, Texas, wrote in and, say, and said, after watching the news story about the LG, and this is on our show yesterday, the rolling TV from LG, battery-powered, made me think about my version. The photo, which anybody watching the uh, the video version of DTNS will see, shows my 43-inch Hisense TV on a rolling stand. All I need to make it powerless power or wireless power is a Jackery power box. I think it'd be a lot less money and would have a longer battery life. This is what I usually watch DTNS on while I eat dinner. I now, love that. We, I want we that. We don't just know what it. the price or battery life of the LG is. True. But I'm going to guess Rick will, will probably come in right that that he's going to be doing it for cheaper. May not be as stylish as LG, so may not be for everybody. But that's pretty cool. I love the idea of plugging a Jackery into that thing. What I mean, a bit of a DIY awesome. situation. Yeah. Yeah. Look at this. People back in the old days, the '60s or whatever, they'd roll a TV in there at dinner and put it up there. I, this looks great. I want to do yeah, what yeah. he's doing. Well, and Nathaniel had another thought, kind of piggybacking off of Rick's thought. Nathaniel said, "I think the mobile LG is a DIY machine. If I can take it from my workbench to under the sink for a how-to video, to the engine compartment for my car for assembly instructions, to the utility room for furnace wiring diagrams." What a wonderful tool. It's a giant helper tablet. Oh, this is a person DIYing and wants the t doesn't want to DIY the TV, but wants the LG TV to help with the DIY. I love I love the the different perspectives on this. It's super cool. And dude. And then we also got Desmond in Richmond, Virginia with a business model idea based on that Dell recycling program we talked about yesterday. Hey DTNS, I was just listening to your latest episode episode 471, where you talked about the new Dell laptops that are designed to be, have the parts all swapped between them. My mind went to an awesome business program they could design where they can serve the same laptops and reuse, reuse the parts for one business. Some, some of their customers at the business or some of the employees might need very high-end machines to do certain kinds of tasks while others don't need as high-end machines and they can move the parts and machines between all the different ones and Dell would provide the service. That might be what they're going for as an option. Love the show. Been listening since 2005 to Tom every day. Thanks. 
Hey, thanks, Desmond. And that that is the kind of thing that I think Dell is is playing around with, whether they've thought of your idea or not. Maybe you should, uh, you know, get on board as a consultant because I, I think that's a cool idea to tell a tell an enterprise like we we will supply you the parts. Your folks can just swap them out as you need them, cascade mm -hmm. them down from the from the power users, you know, to the to the folks who who don't need them. That's a great program. I could totally see that. Oh. And uh, and he said he's been listening to me since 2005. So uh, we should mention if you want to pretend like you're still listening to me in 2005, there's the Buzz Town archive uh, <laughs> that Amos and folks have put together of of all the original Buzz Out Loud episodes from CNET, circa 2005 through through 2013. Uh, go check it out, BuzzTownArchive.com. Excellent. Well, uh, we love your feedback, whether it's audio, whether it's written, anything that you have, uh, photos to share, we'll take it. We love your feedback. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that email with your thoughts. Also, we have a celebration today because we have a brand new boss, Bernardo Tellez, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Bernardo. Yeah, Bernardo gets all of that to themselves. Nicely done, Bernardo. Bernardo. You, you could be Bernardo best. tomorrow, though. Patreon.com slash yeah. DTNS. Nothing's stopping you. Uh, Scott Johnson, uh, we'd love to have you also on the show. Let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Well, just the usual old places. You can check out frogpants.com for everything I'm up to. And uh, I'll say this, just as a little bit of a hint drop. If you are a fan of retro video games, meaning old arcade classics and games from your NES era and that sort of stuff, if that's interesting to you, you're going to want to keep an eye on frogpants.com. In the coming month, uh, the start of January, we have something really special coming. Watch for that. Uh, I'll say no more for now. And if you want to find me on Twitter, you can do that real easy. I'm at Scott Johnson as well. Well, we're live on this show Monday through Friday. Uh, if you didn't know, now you know. 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We will be back doing it all tomorrow because, again, Monday through Friday. <laughs> Just a broadcast. Join us tomorrow. Talk to you then. Part of the Frog Pants Studios Network. For more information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>